town. And we're all here to hear about your fascinating book, Anthrovision, which is not yes. just very interesting, it's very important. Um, just to I introduce hope, you. I, I hope it's very timely, given that we're trying to build back better and we've all suffered massive culture shock in the last year because of lockdowns. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, just for the audience, I'll just introduce Gillian is um, a very distinguished journalist, editor at large with the Financial Times. She has a doctorate in anthropology, and it is that anthropological background that she has brought to bear upon the world, which is anthrovision. So perhaps you could maybe explain a bit about where the idea came from to, to do this book. Well, absolutely. I should start by once again apologizing to everyone who's been waiting. I'm so sorry. Um, this is a function of our new culture of technology and cyberspace. Um, basically, I wrote this book to explain to people why I'm so weird, or rather why I've been so often asked, how come you're so weird? Because I spent the last two and a half decades writing about high finance and economics and policy making from the perspective of a journalist. Um, but before I did that, I actually became a, I actually trained as a cultural anthropologist. I did my field work in a part of the world known as Soviet Tajikistan, or the former Soviet Republic of Tajikistan, just next to Afghanistan. And I was studying marriage rituals as a way to try and explore how the Tajiks navigated their different Soviet, communist and Islamic identities. Now that seems miles away what I've been doing in my day job, um, which is writing about Wall Street, the city of London, financial derivatives, Washington. My day job today is that I chair the editorial board of the FT in the US, but previously I was running the US operations for the Financial Times. And before that, I was in charge of our financial markets coverage. But the basic message of my book is that we're all tribal. We're all shaped by cultural assumptions that we inherit from our environment, which we don't often think about, let alone understand. We're all influenced by those assumptions in a way that can be both good and bad and should try to understand. And that applies as much in Wall Street or the city of London or in parliament or in a company or in any community in the Western world as it does in Tajikistan. So the same skill set that anthropologists have used to look at different cultures can be applied to look at our own culture, and that can deliver tremendous benefits in the modern world. Um, I've used it to foresee the financial crisis, foresee the victory of Donald Trump, foresee pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. But anybody can use it, whether you're a lawyer, economist, politician, financier, corporate leader, or just an ordinary citizen trying to navigate these very, very weird COVID, post-COVID, lockdown, but no longer lockdown kind of times. You mentioned tribes, and we're all a member of one tribe or another. What are the other anthropological concepts that you think are key to uh, using your method? Well, there are lots of anthropological concepts. I mean, first of all, there's the methodology of anthropology which is all about trying to immerse yourself into the minds and lives of other people, um, look at their lives bottom up, if you like, in a holistic way, actually go and live somewhere different or go and talk to someone different from yourself to really create a sort of win-win pattern where essentially doing that, experiencing a bit of culture shock, teaches you empathy for people who seem different from us, a bit strange. Um, and that's really valuable in a world where we're all so tightly connected that we're all prone to contagion from each other, not just medical contagion, you know, germs flash around the world, but also ideas, financial shocks, cyber shocks, anything like that. We're all prone to contagion. So we need to understand each other with more empathy. And it's worth stressing that point because actually the pandemic has made most of us more myopic because we're locked down with people like us, with our tribe, and when we go online, we tend to only talk to our tribe. But anthropology doesn't just do that, the method. It also uses that experience, that taste of culture shock, to understand yourself better too. Because there's this great Chinese proverb that a fish can't see water. We can't see the cultural assumptions that shape us unless we have something to compare or contrast them against. And so 
<laughs> going and looking at other cultures enables you to get empathy for others and better self-understanding. And it enables you to look at what anthropologists call social silences, the parts of the world that we tend to ignore, all these cultural assumptions. And looking and thinking about our social groups and our patterns, our tribes, to use that word in a very loose sense, there's one way of doing this. You know, who do you affiliate with? Who do you identify with? Who do you regard as your in-group or out-group? But you can also do that by thinking about space. How do you organize your space? How does that reflect the mental map that you have in your head automatically? And how does it reinforce it by virtue of actually living in it? Um, you know, you can think about your symbols around you. You can think about your passage of time. Um, there are concepts like liminality, which can be very interesting. And to give one tiny example of how you can use this, um, liminality is an idea that whenever you have a big transition point in your life, um, you tend to have a set of rituals to market and symbols, which often involve withdrawing from the world for a moment or turning the normal symbolic order upside down. This was actually first spotted amongst African groups by anthropologists, but it applies to the West as well. If you think about you know, New Year's Eve rituals, you deliberately quite often invert the social order. You go mad, you go wild, you act crazy or something for a bit to kind of indicate a passage of time. Um, and one way to have made sense of the lockdown is that it wasn't just a state of limbo or dead time. It was actually a moment of liminality when we all withdrew into this very different space and used all kinds of symbols to indicate that this wasn't normal. Um, it was a transitional moment. You know, clean-shaven men suddenly got beards. Um, and when you start seeing cultural patterns in that way, it can really help you make sense of what's happening in the world around you. You mention in the book um, the idea of weird, Western, educated, individualistic, can't remember what the R and, R and D are, but... Um, rich, rich and democratic. Rich, yeah, exactly, yeah, rich. And we're, we're, we in the West are weird, and that is actually not just a handy acronym, it refers to how our brains work. Literate people tend to have poorer face recognition and other characteristics. So how does that connect once we've acknowledged that we in the West are actually different from large parts of the world who are not weird, how does that connect to um, using an anthropological perspective on things? Well, one of the key messages of the book is to quote an anthropologist who worked with Intel, the gigantic chip company, just because it's your worldview, you can't assume it's everyone else. Or to put it another way, you know, human beings are wired to assume that the way they organize their lives and the assumption they hold are inevitable and natural and normal. And that kind of everyone else should do that too. And if they don't, there's something wrong with them or they're somehow inferior. And that's simply not true. Human beings have a huge spectrum of difference in terms of how they imagine the world and organize it and, you know, try to arrange life around them. And this issue about weird is very interesting in terms of our brain psychology because, you know, Westerners tend to assume, particularly um, professional Westerners, that it's natural and normal to see the world in a linear, rational way. And, you know, they essentially do that because the process of learning to write an alphabet or read an alphabet requires sort of linear thought. Um, and it's a very sort of, you know, rational process whereby you add together sounds in a letter and create a word. And so if you read all day, if you're educated um, at a university, if you're like a journalist used to essentially handling words as your livelihood, you take that for granted and you assume that that's the only way to think and the way everyone should think. But as an anthropologist called Joseph Henrik showed, in fact, that simply isn't true. Um, this weird phenomena, West educated, individualistic, rich and democratic, is an aberration by the standards of the sweep of history. You know, weird people like me think that it's normal that we should create our own identities, we should choose our own families, we should be able to have the freedom to essentially, you know, act as we want, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a real outlier by the standards of human history. And the key point about this is that once you understand this, it helps you to think about, you know, the 
whether it's right or not to say, use psychology as a tool to understand everyone in the world. I mean, most psychology studies are drawn up by Western university professors using the nearest raw material or human guinea pigs to hand to do their tests on, which happens to be university students who are for the most part Western educated and trained to think in this linear way. That may not be typical of everyone, but once you understand that distinction, you can also begin to understand how and why people misunderstand each other. Because even inside the same population, you can get differences on a weird and non-weird spectrum. And I would argue that Donald Trump's techniques and ability to communicate with voters very much tapped into non-weird thinking, a tendency to see an entire picture, to feel things intuitively with different senses, not through linear logic. And the weird parts of the population, i.e. journalists, didn't understand his appeal, the more non-weird people did. Okay. And, I mean, using the, the, this, this uh, bundle of, of uh, methods and insights, you produce some fascinating examples from your experience as a journalist. And I'm thinking especially, perhaps you could say something about the way Mars approached pet foods and the, and, and the role of pets in the weird world, so to speak, is very different from the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the other big precepts of anthropology, which everyone should think about, is the need to listen to social silence. And by that, I mean that, you know, we live in a world drowning of noise. There's things constantly grabbing our attention. And if you are trained in a particular profession, you're trained to focus on whatever your profession really cares about. So if you're a doctor, you focus on medical issues. Um, if you're a good techie, you focus on computer science. Um, and often it's what we don't talk about, the silences in our world, which actually are more telling. And they could be silence because occasionally someone's created a plot to hide something. More usually, though, we have cultural assumptions that simply make it seem natural to turn our eyes from parts of our world because it's boring or geeky or dull. And the issue of pet food is one of those, um, or the issue of pets, because, you know, until very recently, a company like Mars was selling its pet food on the basis of what the noise was around pet food and dogs, which was the dog and the health of the dog. And there was a presumption that, you know, people bought dog food and judged it on the basis of whether or not their dog liked it and whether it seemed to be healthy for the dog or not. That seems kind of logical. The problem, of course, is that dogs can't speak and tell you if they like the food or not and almost nobody bothers to check whether their dog food is healthy or not. And so some anthropologists went out to see what was really going on with dogs in families. And they realized that actually, when you watch people with their dogs and observe them and try to listen to silences, the real benefit of having a dog in many families is not about the dog, it's about the humans. It's about the fact that dogs can actually bond families together or bond people together um, not just if you're walking in the street, people will stop you if you have a dog and talk to you, which they don't always. They do that even in New York, but also because dogs end up almost like a glue for family relationships um, inside a household. So the issue at stake really is about d humans connecting with other humans, not so much about animal welfare or the health of a dog. And that might sound weird. And in fact, it's very weird if you look at it in the context of most cultures in the world, like an anthropologist would, because in most cultures in the world, dogs are seen as being something which is almost existing in opposition to a family or humans. You know, historically, dogs tended to be out in the fields. Um, and conceptually, you know, you'd ha often have a cognitive map, a vision of the world, whereby you had animals versus humans. Whereas the Western world talks about dogs as part of the family. And they've literally historically in the last hundred years gone from the field to the yard, to the porch, the house to the bed you know they've become almost part of the family but that reflects another weird trait which is that you know weird people western people today are so addicted to the idea of personal agency and choice and individualism and empowerment that they think they can not only use a pick and mix approach to choosing their music playlist which by the way 50 years ago no one even thought they had a right to do but you can choose your music playlist you can choose your coffee cup coffee, you can choose your news sources, you can choose your identity, but you can also choose your family, you can fashion your family. 
You don't have to just inherit what you have. So dogs are being used by people to kind of fashion their family. And that means if you're trying to sell dog food or market dog food, you're probably better off talking about humans and human to human bonds, not the health of the animal. I mean, you, you, you point out in the book about how um, in the West, our own view of ourselves, just as with the, 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 the point you just made about the noise, the noise is that uh, we may be very rational and so on, especially people like computer engineers. And yet, the, uh, even computer engineers want to think they're human. I mean, maybe you could, I mean, I think it's fascinating, the example of the humming as a way of de de uh, deciding, a, uh, uh, making a, an important decision, really, about a software that's going to affect the whole world, but was decided by a, a group of engineers humming. Yeah, well, just in the same way that people look at dog food and they look at the noise and they ignore the context that everyone tends to, you know, overlook the silence. Um, the way we behave in offices, um, even around technology, or especially around technology, has a similar pattern. Because if you ask people what they do in offices, they tend to say, well, I'm there to do my job. So if you're an accountant, you focus on accounts. If you're a computer scientist, you're designing code. And particularly in the world of people who handle computer science for a living, you know, they assume that somehow computers are a-cultural, a a-personal, you know, a computer is a computer anywhere in the world. And that when you get a bunch of computer scientists together, they're gonna to be using maths and logic and the processes of an office to get their job done. And what's fascinating is that if you look at a group of computer scientists who are part of something called the IETF, the Internet Engineering Technical Forum, who actually built many of the key pillars of the modern internet, um, if you look at how they've traditionally got their job done, they come together as a group to write the all important code, but then they vote on whether or not to use a certain code solution or not based not on any online poll or a system of voting, but based on something they call rough consensus, which they create by coming together and humming. And they judge which path to take according to which hum is louder in a room. Um, I know it seems very hard to believe, but if you don't believe me, there's all this stuff online, which I talk about in the book, where you can literally go online and watch it. And you might say, well, that's kind of just totally weird. But it really goes back to my key point, which is that rituals bond us together as tribal groups. Um, and in this case, the ritual offers us something which is so important and so often overlooked inside offices, which is a piece of sense making. It's a way of navigating the world around us, not based on our linear sequential reasoning, but on our ability to read the mood of a crowd. Um, to read all the different signals we, we can collect about people, about environment, and everything else. And, sense, and humming is sense-making because people can tell how the crowd feels. It's not just a simple yes, no answer. And what's really interesting is when COVID-19 happened and the IETF went online, um, you know, you'd think that the computer techies of all people would be well-placed to go online and do their work. And they were in some ways, but they really, really missed their humming because we all need that kind of personal human connection and that ability to engage in sense-making. I mean, you mentioned in passing the idea of, of, of us needing the uh, uh, rituals in our lives. How, I mean, we've seen the emergence in the last few years of um, statue toppling, Black Lives Matter, social justice movements that seem to be imbued with with rituals and s symbolic behavior. Is that something that you've thought about from an anthropological perspective? I have thought about it um, because, you know, of two things. One is it shows that rituals matter and symbols matter. And we often forget that, but they do. Um, secondly, that symbols and rituals tend to be shaped by the elites of a society at any one time. And there's a wonderful anthropologist called Pierre Bourdieu who pointed out that the way that any elite stays in power is not just by controlling the means of production and economic capital, i.e. money, but by shaping cultural capital, you know, what we value as symbols, what we choose to respect. Um, and statues are absolutely part of that. Um, so toppling them is one way of indicating that symbolically 
that the order is changing. Um, now, for what it's worth, I actually think that toppling them in a crude manner is actually in some ways not particularly helpful or the right thing to do always. Um, I think actually setting them in context is more important or actually even better setting up new statues and new things that you want to admire and respect. Um, so that's where I tend to come because, you know, a lot of the topic that's going on right now um, is quite arbitrary. Um, you know, Columbus Day in America is due to be celebrated next Monday. Um, Columbus Day was abolished a couple of years ago because Columbus is regarded as being synonymous with the massacre of indigenous Indians, which was certainly a terrible, terrible thing that everyone needs to know about and react with horror and remember. Um, however, you know, Columbus himself didn't massacre the Indians. Uh, we now have Italian American groups writing letters um, and adverts saying actually Columbus was in some ways a connector of the world in quite a positive sense in that he actually built bridges across the Atlantic um, and created sort of all kinds of new connections. Now, you can argue both things, but I think the context is what's needed and a desire to erect um, more statues, not less, in some ways. Yeah. I'll give you another example. You know, when the Black Lives Matter issue erupted around Cambridge University, um, there's an, an eminent American historian of um, black history called Henry Skip Gates, um, Henry Skip Gates, um, who's affiliated with Clare College, which is a college that I also was at. And he said very rationally, well, instead of just toppling all these statues, how about we erect a new one? So metaphorically, so we created a scholarship fund um, for in honor of Alexander Crummel, who was the first ever African-American to graduate from Cambridge University that no one knew about until recently. He actually graduated in the late 19th century. Amazing, amazing, amazing story. And so the idea is by holding that up as a symbol, you can actually inspire a new generation um, and try to change the symbolic narrative we're communicating um, and hopefully fund a few um, people who need scholarships too. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fascinating because a lot of this turns around, um, I mean, this phrase sense-making, what, um, what sense we make of a situation if it has a rich context and a, a deep description, a thick description, um, we make more sense of it. Perhaps you could explain a bit about sense-making. Yeah, I mean, sense-making comes from um, a concept which originally came out of Polynesia, where some anthropologists and, in fact, former U.S. naval officers spotted that, you know, they were used to navigating the sea with a kind of GPS mentality, that you plugged in the coordinates of where you want to go and then basically plot your course using radar or GPS or whatever else. Um, but of course, Polynesian sailors, who are brilliant sailors, don't do that. Um, they use sense making, which is they basically collectively read the wind and the waves, they smell the air, and they look at currents, and they use all those elements as a group to kind of read the environment and constantly react to it um, in a very reflexive way. And, you know, professional people, particularly those of a weird mentality, think that they run their lives like GPS. You know, I want to get to here in my career. I want to do this in my day job, et cetera, et cetera. And the reality is that most of them actually use sense making too, if not most of the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's wonderful. It's one reason why we benefit from offices and why our surroundings are quite important in, to use another anthropology concept, habitus, the physical patterns in our surroundings, the symbolism really matters because it reflects our worldview and um, basically embeds it in our, in our minds and lives. Um, so there's nothing wrong with sense-making, but the minute you start realizing that actually most of us are living a sense-making world, and we live life on many dimensions, and we should think in that way in many dimensions, we end up having a much, much um, you know, richer experience and a better place to understand the world. And I'll give one other tiny example of this, which is um, very relevant for anybody who's a parent and has kids who are addicted to their cell phones, which, by the way, is many people it's where I am right now. You know, you as a parent probably say, oh, my God, my kid won't get off their cell phone somebody should study the technology and work out how it becomes addictive and treat it as a problem of cell phone technology and computer science. 
Fair enough, but that's only part of the problem. The cell phone is a noise in that situation. The silence is what's happening in the real world, physical world that we ignore. And there's a lot of research in America showing that the physical movements of children and teenagers has been increasingly constrained in the last hundred years. You know, hundred years ago, teenagers would roam between towns by themselves from a young age. Um, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they'd walk the streets, they might bike to school, they would physically walk out and meet their friends down the bike sheds, whatever. They could do that without parental supervision or scrutiny or control. They could test boundaries and congregate. Now, many teenagers have such overscheduled lives with helicopter parents um, that they're driven around. They haven't got physical freedom or movement to the same degree. Um, maybe where you are, they do, but in much of the European and American world, they don't. So cyberspace is one of the few places where it's easy to roam without parental control and to collide with the unexpected and to congregate with your friends. So you can't hope to understand what teenagers are doing in cell phone space without looking at the context and without being aware of this wider sense-making experience that we all have around everything, including cell phones. And it's fascinating. And it also brings us to the idea of the embodied experience because these children, though they are roaming and having adventures in cyberspace, so to speak, it's a disembodied experience. It only is involving their mind and their, their eyes. And, and it's something that the anthropologists were emphasized is that we have to look at the embodied experience that we're having as you know a full human being rather than just what's going on in our heads absolutely and in fact it's so very important because again part of the real mentality is that we venerate the mind um you know and that causes all kinds all kinds of problems for one thing it means that we often devalue jobs that don't involve the mind david goodhart's written this wonderful book about you know um head heart hand um, about how basically we should be valuing caring professions and manual professions far more. But another problem is that we tend to ignore our body physical experience and how our bodies think and learn. Again, there's a great anthropologist called Simon Roberts who points out that so much of our bodily rituals and habits is where our memory lies and where our embedded cultural assumptions are embodied is, you know, indicates the word embodied cultural assumptions, which can be so powerful about how we actually live our lives. And if you want to, you know, think about this in a very timely way, think about face masks. Um, when face masks were adopted belatedly by Western governments, you know, if only Western governments had had a bit more, you know, anthropology insight, they would have known to learn the lessons from Asia immediately and bring face masks in because there was so much evidence about how they can work in Asia which, you know, an anthropologist with a desire to have curiosity about other cultures and empathy would have brought that lesson in immediately. Um, but once the idea of face masks came in, they were presented as merely medical devices that stop germs. Well, they do, but they have two other important elements which cut to the core of anthropology. The ritual of putting on a face mask each day acts as a psychological prompt to tell you to change behavior. It's a habit which is a part of the embodied experience. And it's also a signaling device, which indicates that you kind of care about other people. You know, you're basically a good citizen and you're part of this group and you want to be part of it. Now, sadly, in some cases, that cultural signaling device can also have a sense of tribalism that can be negative. So in America, wearing a face, face mask became a sign that you were basically Democrat and some hardcore Republicans refused, which is kind of dumb, but anyway. Um, but, you know, the point about rituals creating psychological prompts and memory and learning and indicating groups or being part of a group is really important. So long way of saying anthropology matters. It's not a magic wand to understand the world with. But when you add it into economics, finance, computer science, medicine, law, almost any area of life, it's one thing that can really make us wiser and hopefully help us to build back better. And even possibly richer. I mean, you were well known for predicting the crash of 2008. And what what what, what anthropological insights helped you towards that that early insight? Well, it all started really when I went to a big conference in 2005 in France with investment bankers, 
And I walked in and I thought, wow, I'm back in Tajikistan. Because in many ways, investment banking conferences are like Tajik wedding rituals. You know, that sounds offensive to some bankers, although it actually should be a compliment because Tajik wedding rituals are good fun. But, you know, investment banking conferences bring together a scattered tribe reaffirm social ties and reaffirm a shared worldview through their rituals. And the worldview that I saw in 2005 essentially reflect the fact that bankers at that stage in this field of finance thought they were in some ways a tribe set apart, very elite, because they were in command of a technology and language that no one else understood. It was kind of like financial Latin. Um, but they were also shaped by a creation myth mythology that like all creation mythologies and every single professional group and tribe has a creation mythology. This creation mythology was riddled with contradictions, which ended up causing the financial crisis. Um, they thought they'd created a way to create perfect free markets and spread risk around, which turned out to be completely wrong because the instruments couldn't be traded with market prices. And the risk was being simply sliced and diced and repackaged and then rehidden in new places. And they had a vision of finance that essentially, if you looked at their PowerPoints, were supposed to be about helping humans. And in fact, they'd taken human beings out of all of their PowerPoints. They just had Greek letters. Because finance had become an abstract game of numbers and equations not embedded in society. And that essentially created this sense of tunnel vision, which led to the whole thing spinning completely out of control. Um, it also meant that um, bankers weren't actually in touch with what was happening on the ground and how their products were being used and abused. So on the back of that, I came back and wrote a series of pieces saying, finance is spinning out of control, there's gonna be a crisis. Um, you know, and in many ways, the silence in the system was all about the fact that you know, bankers, this tribe of elite bankers had invented these products, which kind of didn't make sense, but were being ignored by everyone else. Um, and looking at silence pays off. Yeah, and I love that idea of each tribe having its own creation myth as a kind of key to unlock it. I think... Journalists, by the way, journalists too. You know, we're not special. We are as tribal and as blinkered and blind and beset with creation myths as everyone else. So we need to look as journalists at our own um, structural patterns as well. What would be the journalistic creation myth? <laughs> Um, I think a journalist creation myth um, is that somehow we have the truth. Um, you know, on a good day, journalists get 40% of the truth. Um, they always have to be humble enough to listen to others. Another journalist myth is just because they work with words, to go back to the point about weird people, because they work with words and are trained to think in a sequential word-based way, that that's the only correct way to do it. Everyone else should think that way too. Um, you know, we've seen that trip journalists up when it came to making sense of Donald Trump. I would argue of Brexit too. Um, you know, journalists are hardwired to assume that to go back to David Goodhart's um, phrasing, heart, head, hand, journalists assume that head somehow is superior. And guess what? Not everyone else looks at the world that way and journalists are not always right in that assumption. And especially you mentioned Trump, journalists pretty much got him completely wrong and, and, and ended up uh, uh, unable to deal with him because he was using a different epistemology, a different way of talking to people. Absolutely. I read about this in the book. I mean, I say that, you know, one of the ways to understand Donald Trump is go to a wrestling match. Um, because Donald Trump basically became best known in America, not through The Apprentice Show on television, but through world, um, worldwide wrestling. Um, and essentially, these wrestling is something which, you know, most elite Americans um, don't spend a lot of time at but they are extraordinary ritualistic events. They're very noisy, aggressive, stage managed um, bouts of fighting. The audience you know, gets whipped up into a high emotion, but they kind of know it's artificial. Um, and it's all about name calling. You know, if, and basically what Donald Trump did was to borrow that performative aspect of those rituals and take it into his political um, campaigns. And people who had been to wrestling matches sort of recognize that and knew that they should take him seriously, but not ritually, literally. Of course, journalists who think with their heads and often hadn't been to wrestling matches didn't understand, and they took him literally, but not seriously. Interesting. Now, perhaps I'm, uh, I'm sure the audience probably have questions they want to ask. Um, 
Is there anyone who would like to set, fire a question at Gillian? I really engaged so far. Thank you. I'm sorry if I'm not very clear. But thinking of movements that are now a big wave in our society yet struggle to gain traction, the Extinct Rebellion message is both welcome, but at the same time, actively opposed. Are there any skills that they need to employ to be more effective at uh, persuading the wider population to take the action they need to take? Well, I think the Extinction Rebellion is a very powerful sign of how and why symbolism matters and how it can grab attention significantly. I think the big challenge right now is to work out ways to communicate it to people um, in a way that isn't threatening um, and to show you know, positive action steps that could be taken to try and make a difference. And also to show people that you know, the whole climate change um, you know, challenge needs to be regarded in a positive sense, not negative. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or in terms of you know, um, economic welfare, social justice. And right now with the whole issue of rising fuel prices, um, that's a particularly big issue. I mean, you've only got to think about the Gilets Jaunes and how they fought back against the um, fuel tax um, levies in France a few years ago. Um, so, you know, the thing I'd say about, you know, um, Extinction Rebellion is yes, by all means, I understand the importance to have drama to, you know, grab the conversation and actually focus people's minds. Um, the next step really is about the practical, what do we do next point. Very good. Now, any, any other one over there? Do you think uh, Donald Trump uh, was using that uh, knowingly or whether it was just natural for him to use that technique, the wrestling well, I wouldn't technique? I wouldn't pretend to know what is inside Donald Trump's heart. Um, <laughs> but, um, although I have met him in the White House, um, it was the most chaotic, weird interview I ever did in my life. Um, but um, I think he works as much through instinct as design and he instinctively feels what does and doesn't work. Um, and so I think he kind of recognized that whipping up the crowds, using phrases like, you know, crooked Hillary, little Mark Rubio, that was kind of almost a deliberate technique because, you know, he'd seen people use that in the wrestling ring and knew it worked. Um, and he knew quite deliberately that he could play with his followers, um, put out outrageous comments, you know, if I was to choose someone in Fifth Avenue, no one would care, all those kind of things. I think he knew he could say that deliberately to shock and provoke. And he also knew um, that grabbing the airwaves with things like Twitter was effective. Um, did he sit there and reason it out like the way that I have in terms of weird mentality? I don't think so. But he certainly knew that playing up against the elite was a powerful political um, tool. Interesting. Any other, any other questions from the floor here? Or are we all done? How are we doing? Oh, we've got a bit more time. Um, I just think, I mean, I think it's not just a, a very interesting book, I think it's a very wise book because you are enjoining us to have a much broader vision, whereas our whole culture seems to be um, geared towards having deeper, you know, we, we talk about drilling down and narrowing down and, and specializing. So um, I think that's really a really, really good thing, this breadth of vision idea one of the other one of the key messages in the book is that you know we live in a world beset with tunnel vision where we are trained professionally to focus and be efficient um and essentially to operate in tunnels to screen out everything else and most of the intellectual tools that we've developed in recent decades are really tunnel vision tools you know economic models are defined by what you put in the model and everything else is an externality um a balance sheet is defined by a desire to measure profit and loss and everything else is kind of like a footnote you know a big data set is defined by what it looks at um and you know the kind of external noise is kind of you know knocked out and one of my messages in my book is that we need to pay more attention to the context of our models to externalities particularly if the externalities are changing i mean climate change the environment physical environment used to be an externality that we ignored and nobody would dare ignore that today um, the cultural context in which people perceive things is, again, something which used to be ignored, but it matters now. 
And in addition to that, I'd argue that if you want to try and get that lateral vision, you know, anthro vision, it also really pales to think about trying to combine different um, bodies of knowledge and epistemologies. So anthropology plus economics, anthropology plus computer science, anthropology plus finance or law is a really potent combination. And we really need that right now as we look at, you know, the challenges we face. I mean, to go back to the issue of masks and pandemics, you know, if there was ever a moment where we've learned you can't fix healthcare just with brilliant medical science or just with computer science, it's now because, you know, scientists raced to create these amazing vaccines. They did very well. But guess what? If you have vaccine hesitancy and people won't take vaccines, which is absolutely the story of, you know, America right now in parts of America, you know, you aren't going to be the pandemic. You know, culture matters. And ignoring culture, ignoring context is a bad idea. I mean, just one last, I think this will probably wind up quite soon, but the thing that I, what, what question I had is how do we start dis, dis, decide which tribes are better? Once we uh, know we're all a member of a different tribe, is it just might is right? I mean, what, what does the anthropologist have to say on the relative standing of tribes? Well, that's a really important question. I'm so glad you asked it. You know, anthropology is a weird discipline because its origins come from a mindset that modern anthropologists hate, which is the original 19th century anthropologists really stumbled on the idea of studying culture in order to go around the world into what were then the British colonies, study the natives, um, either because they wanted to work out how to control them or to tax them or to trade with them or to convert them, or because they thought that if they went and studied the natives, primitives, they called them, they would somehow have the origins of humanity laid out on a plate or laid out on a laboratory um, test tube. And that was because when Charles Darwin had his idea of human physical evolution, that bled into, in the 19th century, this idea of social and cultural evolution. And this assumption that you could basically rank societies and cultures on a scale, or rather on a chart, and measure how developed they were and assume that they evolved from underdeveloped to developed or primitive to civilized, or more specifically from savage, which was invariably in the colonies, to civilized, which was basically Western Europe. So there was this kind of mindset that you could have in a hierarchy and that cultures were fixed boxes and you could sort of stack them up against each other on moral value. And guess what? White men were at the top. Now, thankfully, in the early 20th century, that mindset was completely rejected by some anthropologists who said, actually, there's no such thing as this massive inbuilt hierarchy. You can't just assume that A evolves to Z on a preset path and by the way, there's no moral hierarchy here either. You know, other cultures are just as valuable, probably often more valuable. And P.S., we can learn from them. And we can also learn from them and recognize that cultures don't exist as boxes. They're not sort of bounded with rigid edges. They're, they're always changing and fusing and blending. It's more like a river with more streams coming in, the river banks kind of being a bit muddy. Um, and that's a really important distinction to stress because today anthropologists wouldn't say, I'm gonna go around the world and try and rank cultures on some kind of pre-assigned idea of value. That's kind of what the Nazis did. And guess what? The first books that the Nazis built, burned, some of the first books were by early 20th century anthropologists who had rejected the 19th century idea. Um, instead, anthropologists say, you know what, we need to apply this tool set and toolkit as much to the Western world as the non-Western world, if we come from the Western world. And we need to try and understand others so that we can both get empathy for what's happening on the other side of the world or for strangers down the end of our back end of our roads, because we actually need to understand each other. You know, I said earlier, we live in a world of contagion, medical contagion, financial contagion, <coughs> economic contagion. We don't have a contagion of understanding of each other, far from it. Um, and we also need to do that to understand ourselves as well and to see how cultures can change. And that is such an important point to stress 
Because one of the things that's happened as we go into cyberspace is that it's reinforced our, we our weird tendencies to assume that we have a God-given right to customize our world. Um, you know, I said earlier about talking about dogs and families. You know, people customize their family. They customize their identities online. They customize their social tribe. Everything becomes like a playlist, a pick and mix experience online in a way that you can't do in, your, in the real world. So when people go online today, they don't just take their tribal allegiances, their social patterns with them, they intensify them significantly. I mean, to understand this, think about who you follow on social media. Think about the news sources you have and ask how many of those are completely outside your tribe or existing um, affiliations. I would bet they're not. And so we're actually becoming in some ways more tribal than not. And we're becoming in risk of becoming more prejudiced, particularly given that we've been locked down for the last year with our own pod, our own social tribe. And that is really, really dangerous. So perhaps one of the most important messages that anthropology can give everyone today is not about worrying about which tribe is better than which or which value set is better than which, you know, because that's kind of, you know, that is not something we should be doing. The important message is to impart this idea that being curious about other people with different ideas is really, really important, now more pure, important than ever. Being willing to taste a bit of culture shock is really, really important. Being open-minded about what is your culture and their culture and recognizing that cultures can change is incredibly important. And if you need any other reason to realize that, just think about the fact that COVID-19 has just given us all the biggest cultural shock that some of us will ever face, the experience of seeing our office work smashed into pieces, being forced to go back online and remake our habits online. And that's been terrifying, but it's been less than actually culture matters, but culture is malleable. Culture can change. And now we have an amazing opportunity to consciously reflect on our cultural patterns and assumptions and change them for the future if we want. But it all starts with noticing that culture matters. And that's why I think anthrovision is so important right now. Well, that's a really, really great takeaway for, for all of us here. Um, I think we're just very grateful for you talking to us and sharing your ideas. Um, as I said, it's a fascinating and, and uh, intriguing new way of looking at things, I think. So uh, thank you very much, Gillian. And thank you very much for your interest in Hollywood and Steph being late. One problem about the new culture is the technological glitch issue. Apologies, thank you. <laughs>you have characterized Donald Trump and his techniques, what would you make of Boris Johnson? Quick. <laughs> Very similar. Very similar. Okay. And one last one. Do you think there needs except to be a that, new kind of Boris, education? He borrowed his performative style, not from wrestling, but probably from Love Actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much.